Oh, why, hello there, Gormand. It's been a while since I've made a full-length video on this very quintessential film company. I thought that I covered everything in the secret logos of Gormand 1 and 2, but nope. We found even more logos from the oldest but one of the most fascinating film companies in the entire world. For example, did you know that the Sun Globe logo was introduced earlier than you think, or that Gorman had more divisions than previously known, or that there are multiple variants of the 1963 logo? Sergio Wiki and Logopedia get updating, as I welcome you to the secret logos of Gorman 3, 1910 to 1979. Right off the bat, we have a subsidiary of Gormand. You all should know that Pathé, Universal and Paramount all had newsreels. Other newsreels in the US were The March of Time, which was developed between 1955 and 1951, Fox Movie Tone News, which was from 1928 to 1963, and Hearst Metro Tone News, which ran between 1914 and 1967. Of course, Gorman had newsreels, but it seems they had quite a few over the years. The earliest one I could discover was called the Gorman Graphic, which began in 1910 and ended in 1934. The Gorman Graphic, like the other newsreels, depicted events and news for the public. There's nothing really remarkable about it, but I do like how most newsreels have a different style when the text boxes come on screen or whatever they're called. Sometimes you'll see the normal Gorman logo when these text things come up. I have found what seems to be a proper logo from this newsreel company, and it looks like this. It's difficult to find out when this was introduced and how long it was used for. I don't think they kept this logo all the way until their death in 1934. I think most newsreels past the 20s would have just had whatever print logo Gorman had at the time. The number in the bottom right corner is the newsreel number. 1852 is quite a high number, so I think this capture was seen between the late 1910s and early 1920s, but I'm not entirely sure. On number 1198, I was able to find something else. I discovered the black and white version of the 1908 to 1920 logo in full. I don't know if this is real or not, because it just seems to be glued on. Newsreel number 1198 can be seen on YouTube. Two more points about the Gorman graphic. The newsreels were very short, most of them hopping around the 6 minute mark. Number 433 here, from 1915, is approximately 4 minutes. Number 1852 was only 48 seconds, but some of the film could be lost. The other point is that it was replaced in 1934 with Gorman's second newsreel subsidiary, which we will uncover later. For now, I want to talk about the 1908 to 1920 logo if you don't mind. We all know about the testing version from 1912, and possibly the sepia tone version, or the gold version, which we have footage of in 1915, as well as the black and white version we discussed earlier, which we have definitive proof of in 1930. But it seems there was another colour version from 1911. It's a green version, which you might remember I uploaded to YouTube a while ago. I want to give you some more information on it. This was, apparently, a common practice of French studios back in the day. The ending logo or credits, or sometimes the entire film, would have been tinted to mark the product as authentic and not a pirated version, which is fair enough. This was, of course, before Leon Gorman developed a full colouring process for the film market, but this makes me believe that tinting everything was expensive, which then makes me think this wasn't used much outside of 1911. I've only seen this idea of tinting on two films. Oddly, there's more deterioration on the actual film than the logo. It's hard to signify why this is. Well, that's something to add to the CRG wiki. The 1908 to 1920 logo was a lot more common than I thought, considering film preservation wasn't taken seriously back then. In terms of the Gorman text, there seems to be several versions. On this version, which you remember is from the book, notice that the G is thicker than the other letters, and the U extends upwards a little. The N also seems to be squished. This would have been seen on the black and white version. On the gold version, the G is thinner, the U doesn't extend, the M is slightly longer, and the N is no longer squashed. This also applies to the 1912 coloured version. 
On the green version, both the U and the M extend, the O is more square looking, and the N is squeezed. On film posters, anything goes. There doesn't seem to be any consistency or any patterns. There is a version from 1914 with a crown, for example, and this version with something else inside the daisy from 1922. Trying to find every single version of this logo that I've paid on posters and advertisements is an insane task. It's difficult to conclude why there are so many variations of this logo, but as I said, it was surprisingly common. Print logos don't stop there either. We need to move on to this. I've already talked about this logo in the Secret Logos of Gorman 1, but there's one huge conception I've somehow missed. This logo here is actually what people assume to be the first logo from Gorman, the 1895-1903 version. This logo was not used from 1895-1903. to We know from T's Log 1 that this logo, the LJ Daisy, was the first one. LJ is Leon Gorman's initials. If you take the time to read the Wikipedia pages of Gorman, you can clearly find out that the first logo was invented in 1903. It even says it in the book if you remember the translation I gave you in the first documentary, although the translation was slightly off. On this logo history picture of Gorman, you can see that the so-called 1895 version isn't the first one, the LJ Daisy is. Also, it seems that another version of the LJ Daisy logo has been spotted, looking like this. Like the 1908 logo, the 1914 one has some variation. The focus is the giant G. Ignoring the ring around the 1918 version, we can see that this line here is shorter than the 1914 version. I also found this variant where the line is shorter, and this version from 1919, where the G has a little point. This logo wasn't used as much as the 1908 logo, but it still has its place in Gorman's history. Speaking of 1919, you may remember this logo, the PAX one. In the first documentary, you may remember me saying this. P-A-X. What does that mean? Is it someone's initials? Does it stand for something? I don't know. Either way, it's a logo that Gorman had or was associated with in 1919. I found more information about what PAX means, and more importantly, more logos. It turns out that PAX was a type of projector, which I'm assuming was made by Leon in 1919. The latest date I can get for the projector is 1921. If you like reading, have a look at these three pages here. They give you more information on the projector. The other two PAX logos look like this. This version on screen was seen on a film poster from 1920. I haven't seen this version on any posters, but it looks legit. It seems very unlikely that an on-screen version of this logo would have been created, but you never know. Taking a quick stop at Gorman British for a second, here is a cinema they had in 1922. The logo seen here is something a bit unusual. Gorman British comes more relevant and consequential in the 30s and 40s. For now, let's talk about Gorman Franco film Orbert. GFFA doesn't seem that complicated, but it sort of is, beginning in 1924 with this. Some of you might recall this very strange logo here being in the book with a 1930 label. So what is it doing here on a film poster from 1924? I honestly have no clue. My only guess is that it's a reprinted poster. Skipping to 1928, we have this. This was the Franco film logo until GFFA came about in 1930. Franco Film, I'm assuming, changed their name or merged to create all but Franco Film in 1929 or early 1930, and then would merge with Gorman to form GFFA. I still don't know what the bird is for, but the middle bit, despite me and Logopedia saying that it's to do with Pathway Gorman Metro Actualities, is in fact to do with all but Franco Film. This entire arrangement of a symbol wasn't used for that long. The version without the daisy can be seen on this film poster from 1929, further implementing this has to do with all but Franco film. I have got some footage of the GFFA logo, as well as an on-screen version of the 1930 print. Let me play them to you.
Pretty interesting finds, I must say. Now we return to Gorman British. There exists a supplementary subsidiary to GB known as Gorman British Instructional Corporation, or GBIC, or GBI for short. This was an educational company that specialised in short films, often to do with a place or an event of some kind. The earliest date I could trace was 1933. The latest was 1938, but it's possible they existed for longer. There seems to be two versions of this logo. One reads GBI Present, and one enunciates a GBI production, which despite sounding like a closing logo, is actually an opening one. The logo seen here is based off this Gorman British logo used in the 30s. It can be seen in full on some opening titles of GB films, like The 39 Steps from 1935. The on-screen logo at the time was this. As you can see, the GB Daisy here is a bit different, for some reason. Let me play you some footage I have for this. The daisy can be seen elsewhere, like in this find from 1932. It's difficult to justify when this logo came out, but the earliest I was able to get was 1933. I tried having a look at films from GB from 1931 and 1932, but I couldn't get much. The movie that the company keeps pointing me to is The Goal, released in 1933, and sure enough, this logo was on it. Weirdly, despite Gorman British being a pioneer in the UK film industry during the 30s, this logo is quite rare, even with the re-release of GB's films on VHS, DVD and Blu-ray. Some films have inadequate information, are likely lost, or just don't have the logo on there. Plus, this logo only lasted for a couple of years. Despite all that, I was able to find two variants of this logo, and they're both closing versions. At the end of very few films, the text, the end, will be seen before the logo appears. <laughs> and one version has a different looking daisy, obviously the same as the print logo, with the text, a Gorman British picture, the end. This variant is from 1934. I speculated this logo ended in 1935, as this started showing up in that year. I've also seen this in 1937, where we see a flat GB logo and affiliated text. But the style and position is pretty much the same, so I'm counting this to be in the same category as this 1935 find. I conjecture that this style was substituted in 1937 to this, and here is where Gorman British starts to adjust. You see folks, in 1924, a British film company called Gainsborough Pictures formed. This company immediately began collaborating with Gorman British with their films. In 1937, GB was in a financial crisis, and it seems like Gainsborough was doing them a favour and almost controlling the company. The films they published after the 30s would have had the Gainsborough logo instead of the Gorman British one, and GB would only be seen in the title sequence or credits. Gainsborough's last films were released in 1950, and the studio closed completely in 1951. Gorman British still produced a limited amount of films during the 50s, and their last film, which was a 49 minute film called Supersonic Saucer, which has the Gorman British name in full, was released in 1956. That explains why there's nothing from the 40s on the Gorman British CRG wiki page. There was basically no logo at all, even though the company was still producing films and newsreels. One thing I want to talk about briefly is Gorman Mirror. I had no idea this was a thing until I checked the BFI page. Apparently, Gorman Mirror was a newsreel type that was a partner of the Gorman Graphic. 
they lasted from 1927 to 1932. That's literally all I can give you about them. I have no videos or pictures or even a print logo to show you because very, very little is known about this piece of history. That's precisely what Gormant Mirror is. It's just a small, forgettable part of Gormant's history. However, this leads pleasantly into the third Gormant newsreel, and it's arguably the most important. It is Gormant British News. They replaced Gormant Graphic in 1934 and lasted until 1959. The opening logo stays like this throughout the time they existed, but there are some variants of it. In fact, I found seven. Four of them are opening versions, and there seems to be two announcers. This is the Gomont British News, presenting the world to the world. This is the Gomont British News, presenting the world to the world. One opening version has an American style font. This version doesn't have an announcer. The fourth opening variant is an extended version that reads, let's go to the pictures and see the world's news, also without an announcer. <laughs> That leaves three closing versions. One of the closing versions is almost the same as before, but with a different font and layout for the text at the bottom, and this time there's a different logo in the middle, which is the Gorman British Distribution logo. Probably the weirdest version out of the seven is this one, which has the same American style font as seen previously, but also the rank organisation logo in the middle instead of the Gorman British one. I'll explain why after I've shown you the footage for it. There is a simple explanation why rank is here. In 1941, Rank bought Gorman British and Gainsborough, which could be another reason why there is no normal GB logo in the 40s. Well, we found ourselves in the early 40s now. It's time to head back to the normal Gorman film company and end part one with this. What is this you might be wondering? Well, my friends, we invented Sunglow territory. This logo here has the letters CPLF, but what does that stand for? Well, CPLF in English translates to the Parisian Movie Rental Company. In French, it stands for Compagnie Parisienne de Location de Film. This was a French movie production and distribution company that was active in the 30s and 40s. The oldest film from them, according to this list on Wikipedia, was released in 1932. The film was called Fanny, and is regarded as a classic movie in French cinema. This was a film they distributed, so there's no logo from them on the film. It seems there was no logo from them until the early 40s. The earliest one they had looked like this. This was first seen around 1941, I think. Some of the films they produced had posters that contained both the CPLF logo and the Gormit logo at the time, obviously meaning that they collaborated together until CPLF closed. The earliest date for an on-screen logo so far is 1943, which confused me at first. I said that Gorman closed in the 40s due to World War II and did not reopen until 1947. That is apparently a complete lie, as Gorman made films in 45 and 46. It could mean that the studios closed until 1947, but film production continued. The logo that appeared on these was either this one, which was the print logo from 1936 to 1970, or this one, which was used from the 40s to the 60s. You might remember seeing this in the book. It seems that these two print logos were used simultaneously. Finding out how long these two were used for is quite difficult to find out. There are some weird logos on some posters from 1947, which I will present to you in a minute. 
Anyway, back to CPLF. Let me play you the footage we have of it in 1943. There are seven things to note here. One, it's possible that this logo appeared before 1943, but not before 1941. Two, the presente text is a bit different to the normal version in the way that it's written, how it animates, and the positioning of it. The normal version has the presente text in the bottom right hand corner, it fades all in one go, and it looks different. Three, there is no distribution text on this 1943 version, whilst the normal variant does. 4. There is a version of the CPLF Gourmet logo on screen. Sometimes, this WA power would be seen above the logo. This version doesn't have the Presente text. 5. There's a variant where the Presente text is in a different style. 6. There's a superimposed version of what I just showed you, this time from 1945. And 7. The version from 1943 has an extra bit at the end, where we see this. We have the 1936-1970 Gorman print logo with a ring around it on screen, with some text that reads Un production Societe Marseillez de Films Gourmand. That's not it for the Sun Globe logo. If we ignore the 2006 version of this logo, there's a variant with some completely different distribution text with different music which is from 1951, and a variant of the normal logo also with some different music from 1964. I will show you both of those later. The CPLF variants are surprisingly hard to find. The DisWA Par version is seen on a movie called Martin Roumagnac. The poster for this movie perplexes me a little bit because there's no Gorman print logo on it and it says Gorman Eagle Lion at the top. It's hard to signify how long Gorman Eagle Lion was a thing, but it wouldn't have been around for very long. Eagle Lion was founded in 1946, the founder of it left the studio in 1949, diminishing the studio's output, and they fell in 1954. As far as I know, there is no on-screen logo for Gorman Eagle Lion. What else is there from the forces that I should show you? Oh yeah, this. I found this in 1945 on the film A Cage of Nightingales, which is the same film that has the superimposed CPLF Gorman logo. I've also spotted a similar but more detailed closing logo from 1947, which looks like this. You may remember that I uploaded this a while back. It's possible that there are more Gorman logos like this. Check any film from them around this time to see what else might be lurking around. I also found two interesting print logos from 1947. These were from two posters of a movie called Anthony and Antoinette, which, believe it or not, was the movie where I found this 1947 print logo. Now it's time to talk about Gorman actualities. They were yet another new subsidiary of Gorman, which lasted from 1948 to 1951. There's no videos of the company at the moment. In fact, there's barely anything from Gorman Actualities, which is a bit of a shame because the logo itself looks kind of cool. I feel like this logo has the Gorman print logo fading in, with the Gorman Actualities text zooming in quite quickly. There's not much else to say about this news section, but there is one more which we will talk about later on. Here is the 1951 Sun Globe variant. I noticed that the Gorman distribution text moves differently from the rest of the logo. Perhaps this was added after the globe was animated, probably meaning that the globe used in this logo is a model, similar to what Universal had at the time. I have only seen this 1951 version once. This brings up a good point now that I think about it. If a logo was only seen once or on one program, why go through the time and effort into making it? Perhaps that these rare sun globe variants were seen more than once, but it seems rather unlikely. I don't know if I could consider this a variant, but I thought I would include it anyway, just for the sake of it. I found a brighter version of the normal Sun Globe logo from 1956. It might not look like it, but if we compare it to the normal version, you can see that it's brighter. I wouldn't really call this a variant, although some logos do have different brightness settings, so it's up to you whether you include it as a variant or not. Now we approach the Sun Globe 2, and there's a few interesting things here to talk about.
First thing, there's a handful of variants that aren't on the CRG wiki. We all know about the black and white version at this point, but there are other versions. There's a variant looking like this, where there is a weird gap at the top of the globe. This obviously indicates that the logo is a model. In fact, the entire logo might just be one big piece of cardboard. Also, the presenter text is styled differently here compared to the normal version. Plus, the entire thing is a bit darker compared to the normal variant. But the craziest thing about it is that it's a shortened version. Let me play it to you. The footage I collected for this says that the logo was from 1955, which is very confusing. I found the same variant in 1956 on the film Mary Antoinette. However, that same year, there was the brighter version of the previous logo from the film The Trip Across Paris, which is a black and white film. What's further perplexing me is that I found a black and white version of the Sun Globe logo too in 1958 on the film Back to the Wall. Also in 1958 was this. I have several questions here. One, why is there a giant space at the top? Two, why is the Gorman text in a different font? Three, why is there no box for the Presente text? Four, why is the background a darker blue? And five, was this seen more than once? It was found on the film My Uncle. Some releases of this film didn't have the Gorman logo. For example, the English version didn't. It adds to the collection though. I skipped to the early 60s to see if there was anything unusual, and sure enough, there was. On the film The Count of Monte Cristo, which is from 1961, I discovered this. It appears to be a 2 by 35 by 1 ratio version of the Gormant logo, but brighter and with no Presente text. I have no clue why the Presente text is omitted. There was also these two finds from 1961 from the films Taxi for Two Block and Long Live Henry IV, Long Live Love. This black and white version appeared again in 1962 on the film Arsene Lupin vs Arsene Lupin. On this colour version, I just noticed how easily visible the thin blue circle around the globe is. Anyway, in 1962, I was able to find what might be the weirdest looking Gorman logo in existence. It looks like this. Why is it so dark? You can't see the T, and a bit of the N is invisible. Why does it look so grainy as well? Very unfortunately, I wasn't able to find footage of this variant. I was able to find the film that contained it, which is called Paris Pickup, but it was plastered with the black and white version of the 2004 logo. If you want to find this, you need to somehow find an old release of this film. Considering that it was re-released with the 2004 logo, it seems unlikely now. At this stage, I now believe that the 1963-1970 logo was in use a lot earlier than we originally thought. In 1963, all I found was the black and white version, and in 1964, a colour version. Since we've reached 1964, let me now play you the final variant of the first Sun Globe logo, the version with different music. unclear if this different music version was seen on more than one thing. If it was only used once, it seems unnecessary. Going back to this logo, I think we can safely conclude that this variant here is the plastering version and the variant that was used in the logo's later years. To prove it, here is the logo from a film in 1970. However, despite me looking this deep, it's still uncertain when this logo ended. I believe it was 1971, let me show you why. On the film Cry of the Cormoran was this. I wasn't able to find footage of it, but I think this answers the question. After all that, we can conclude that the first Sun Globe logo was used from 1943 to 1964, which is a total of 21 years, and that the second Globe logo was used from 1955 to 1971, if the versions from the 50s are not plastering logos. If they are plastering logos, we can assume it was either 1958 to 1971 or 1961 to 1971, at least from the evidence I've collected. But if the Sun Globe 2 was seen in 1971, what about the Daisy of Doom? Was that introduced in 1971? Actually, it's quite hard to say.
This logo has brought up many questions over the years, and it has become infamous due to its scariness, but I'm not going to go into that. According to Unifrance, Gaumont made six films in 1970. I found footage of every single one of these films, but four of them had the 2004 logo in its place, one had the Sun Globe logo, and one had no logo at all. There's not much evidence of the logo in 1970 on YouTube. Out of the videos that contain that year in the title, none of them explain what films it appeared on. Maybe if we can find old footage of the films from 1970, there's a chance that the Daisy of Doom will come up, but it doesn't seem like a good shot. It's possible that Gormit made more films from 1970, and they haven't been added to Unifrance yet, we just don't know. Considering that we have proof of the previous logo being used in 1971, I'm going to take a wild guess and say that this logo right here was brought to the table in 1971. My claim could be debunked if we found old releases of Gorman's films in 1970, but for the time being, my point is staying the way it is. We are almost finished. I have two more things to cover. Firstly, Gorman Pathé magazine. This was another merger with Gorman and Pathé that commenced in 1975 and ended in 1981. That is the only picture of them I could get. It seems very irrelevant nowadays because no one really knows a lot about it, but I'm curious to know what else there is about Gorman Pathé magazine. And finally, I have a variant of the 1970s logo where it has the music from the 1995 version. This was seen, I'm assuming, on a re-release of Cop or Thug, which was a movie from 1979. The re-release that I've got must have been between 1998 and 2004. I'll explain why. Firstly, the music is from the 1995 logo, which ended in 2004. And secondly, the film was re-released on DVD, and DVD reached France in 1998. So that is that. You know, I've always wondered if there was a variant of this logo where it said production instead of distribution. It'd be a bit weird, but insanely cool. It seems like there would be because some films in the 70s were produced by them and not distributed. In the end, that's just one little cherry on this already massive yet endorsing cake. From all of this, we can clearly conclude that Gorman has had a monstrous history. Just to finish it off, here is every single footage of Gorman I was able to get my hands on, including things I have not mentioned between 1910 and 1979. Enjoy.
This is the Gaumont British News, presenting the world to the world. This is the Gaumont British News, presenting the world to the world.
Was you expecting this video to be this long? Because neither was I. I'm genuinely impressed that Gorman has had such a huge history, and this documentary shows that perfectly. I've been wanting to make this film since October, when I began to find more finds from Gorman. When I announced it in March, you guys were extremely excited. I wanted to make this a special documentary, and that's why I went into such detail. I absolutely love Gorman to the bottom of my heart, and all my thanks goes to this page in a book from 2009. I really, really hope you enjoyed this video as much as I enjoyed making it. This took us two months to fully complete, and I appreciated every bit of it. Thank you all very much for watching this documentary. Thanks to all the supporters of the channel and everyone who helped me make it. I will talk to you all later. Goodbye!